All right, so we continue our conversation with Helen Ziller joining us for most of the hour. I see a couple of tweets coming in, uh, nothing too serious for the moment, but one of them is asking, which is where we're going to go next. Uh, Helen, still good to have you back with us as well. It's, it seems that the coalitions just seem to be clumsy from the perspective of those who aren't involved in coalitions. It seems like not much is happening except infighting. Are they, are they working in your mind? Well, the coalitions are clumsy because we have multi-party coalitions of the type that are very rarely heard of in the world. I've just spent nine months as part of the negotiating team for Nelson Mandela Bay, and we've got a ten-party coalition there. Mm. And any one of our nine partners could bring the government down if they just decided to cross the floor to the ANC. Mm. And the ANC makes better offers, so they'll say, well, instead of one make her position that the DA's given you, we'll give you a make her position, and then we'll offer you a whole lot of posts in government that you can deploy your cadres to in ANC language. And then it's very easy to follow the politics of extortion and just find a reason to break the coalition and go off. Now, nowhere in the world where they have stable coalitions does that happen. If you look at Europe, which is well known for stable coalitions, you get coalitions between two, three parties that are stable, that have a coalition agreement lasting for a full term of office. Coalition partners can agree with, disagree with each other and contest each other without breaking the coalition. And that's because they have a threshold. You cannot get any seats in a sphere of government unless you meet that voter threshold, which in Germany is 5%. And in Denmark, which is the other country I know reasonably well, is 2%. Now, if there'd been a threshold of even as low as 2% of voter support to get a seat in Nelson Mandela Bay, we would only need to have a two-party coalition mm. because most of those parties didn't even get 1% of the vote. Five of them got in with less than 1%, in fact, 0.23% of the vote. Now, five one-person parties, each one of whom holds the balance of power, which means they can bring the government down if they choose, means that it is very unlikely that you're ever going to have stable government mm, yeah. and that 99% of your time is going to be spent on holding the coalition together. Mm. Now, already one of those partner parties that has, happens to have three seats, it's the big, we've got 48 seats, the biggest partner party has got three, they're already starting to make more demands. They want positions for all three of their councillors and a whole lot of their outside supporters. And, of course, the unstated threat at the beginning is, otherwise we'll just take our vote to the ANC. So in those kinds of situations, you don't have coalition politics. You have kingmaker politics. Mm. But even more, you have the politics of extortion and bribery. And our coalitions are not real coalitions. Tragically, they're rooted in the ANC's culture of the politics of extortion and bribery. Gayton McKenzie fell for it in Johannesburg. Under us, he only had one MAKO position. Now he's got two MAKO positions. Mm. And when the ANC offers you double, then you find a highly principled reason for having to break the coalition and cross the floor. Mm. And the highly principled reason, so-called, was that some people were called rent seekers. Now, what Gate and McKenzie calls people all the time doesn't bear repeating on a family show, but that was just an invented reason to be highly affronted to go to the ANC and get two maker positions rather than one. So, so what happened with, with, with Mpopalatse, with the coalition in Johannesburg specifically? We, we, we had Colleen Makubele uh, right here on the show who insisted that a motion of no confidence against her capability uh, as mayor of uh, Johannesburg were in question. Uh, some of the accusations were against you and your interference into not allowing Mpopalata to do her job but giving instruction from the top down. There was an array of allegations made. But in your view, what exactly <clears throat> happened with the Johannesburg coalition? Well, I've got a thick skin. And I usually take all the completely unfair insults that are tossed at me. But Colleen Makubele went a bridge too far and she's received a letter from my lawyers. Because that lady, um, from day one, representing COPE, and COPE had a single seat. And in our coalition negotiations, COPE got the chair of chairs. And the chair of chairs stands in for 
the speaker when the speaker is temporarily indisposed in a meeting. And she saw that as being deputy speaker, but she wanted to be speaker. And I bet her eyes are ultimately on the mayor's prize. And the ANC was prepared to give her speaker. So it didn't take five minutes before she was fighting with the coalition and had some pretext on which to claim to be the deputy speaker, vote out the speaker, get herself into that position, and cross the floor. Now, we will see how that pans out, mm. but it had nothing to do with any individual. It had everything to do with the personal ambitions of certain people who could get a better deal with the ANC, and therefore had no qualms about tossing aside a coalition agreement that we had taken a long time to negotiate and renegotiated in February when we wanted to bring the PA on board, who swore blind they would be with us till 2026. That all falls out of the window. The allegations against Impor and against Vasco, frankly, were just smoke screens to get the th positions they wanted. And Colleen Makubele's allegations of my interference are just bizarre. I sit on the Coalition Technical Task Team. We have a WhatsApp group. And for example, when Colleen Makubele claims to be the deputy speaker, I inform Dennis Bloom, who is COPE's representative on the technical task team, that there's no such thing as a deputy speaker, that she temporizes for the speaker if the speaker takes a break during a meeting or goes to the loo or whatever, then the chair of chairs sits in. But there's no such thing as a deputy speaker or an alternative speaker. And then COPE must send these things around to their people and must get to Colleen Makubele and she thinks I'm interfering when I'm just giving the facts of the situation to a colleague who is sitting on the same committee as me. You see, this is what you mean by finding a reason to have an argument which doesn't exist. Mm. In Latin, it's called a casus belli, a cause for war. You want to have a war for your own motives, your own ambitions, but then you have to find something that you present as a highly principled reason mm. for starting the fight. You, you mentioned, uh, Colleen Makobele, uh, a letter uh, from your lawyer uh, being served to Colleen Makobele. Why did she go too far? What, is the, what are you hoping to gain by going the legal route? What did she say and what are you well, hoping the, to gain? You know, I, I very rare. I mean, I've, I've, I've sued Julius Malema, and that was when he said, and I don't want to repeat it, but basically he said all the men in my cabinet were there because I was having relationships with them but he did it in much, much cruder terms. And that was a bridge too far. I mean, people have called me many names <clears throat> and it takes a lot as a politician to win a, a defamation case because we're supposed to have much thicker skins. Mm. So courts don't easily grant defamation claims for uh, politicians. But when my husband was sitting in bed in, in the morning and reading this, that Julius Malema was saying that I was, had promoted certain people to my cabinet because I was sleeping with them, that was a bridge too far for me. And so I sued him and I won. And Colleen Makubele said, amongst other things, amongst other things, that my real aim was to get my hands on Johannesburg's 70 billion rand budget and that that was my real aim. I was trying to loot Johannesburg, basically. Mm. And that's also a bridge too far for me. That defamation, is that what you're going off? Yes, well, that and other things. I mean, she had a long, rambling interview with the star and various other things. And yes, I, I'm not, you know, I can take a lot, and I do. And I take a, a myriad of unjust allegations. I mean, I must be the most non-racial person I know, frankly. And I'm non-racial because I treat everybody the same. I don't tiptoe around a person because they're black and not tell them the truth as I see it. I treat black people and white people as intelligent adults who can have an adult conversation and who can digest what they may consider unpalatable truths sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's what I call non-racialism. I don't say th one thing to somebody because they're white and then patronizingly say it in another way to someone because they're black. That is non-racialism, and I'm a committed non-racialist, and always have been. What do you make of Zouak Helimlango's recent comments? I mean, uh, he was also here on ENCA, saying the DA is arrogant, 
um, and that's why the coalition in Johannesburg collapsed. Now, this is uh, a now former member of the DA, but he was a member of the DA at the time. He's not a member of COPE or the ANC or the PA. This is one of your members, uh, also a provincial a member of the provincial legislature, but he said the DA is arrogant and that contributed to its failure with coalition government in Johannesburg. Well, he's never said that in all of the top positions that he's held. He's been on the federal council, he's been on the federal executive, he's been in all the forums. He's never once said the party's arrogant. He's always had his full say. He's been able to disagree with the leadership, as he often has. There's been no issue with it. What he's doing is parroting the playbook of the people who want to break up the coalition with the cause. Now, there is nothing arrogant about saying, we have just negotiated a coalition agreement. Let's stick to it, please, until we can re-look at it in the right time as per the coalition agreement, which makes provision for revision at appropriate times. But when you are sitting with a gun to your head, when one of your numbers is trying to move a motion of no confidence against your colleagues in the coalition, that is not the time to start demanding new positions in a domino no effect, first the speaker, then the MACO member for economic development, then the MACO member for development planning, and so you have a domino effect, and then it started hitting Chwani. Well, we can swap the speaker for this and that. And I said, this is not the time to reopen negotiations. Our focus must be to defeat these motions of no confidence. And while we're in this vulnerable position, trying to renegotiate the entire contract which has just been signed six months ago is the politics of extortion. You're holding a gun to our heads and you're saying, if you don't give us what we want now, which we didn't want six months ago, by the way, but if you don't give us what we want now, we will vote against you in the motion of no confidence. Now that is not good faith negotiations. That is extortion. And I never used a term as strongly but I said, we must stick with the coalition agreement. The coalition agreement provides for appropriate times to relook at it, to see how it's working, mm. and that is what we will do. Now, of course, people are going to call us arrogant for not caving the minute they demand things. We're not arrogant. Sticking to a signed and sealed agreement mm. is not arrogance. It is the rule of law. We're a party of the rule of law. And if some people think that it's arrogant to stick to your word and to do what you said you would do and signed your name to, mm. if some people believe that's arrogance, then we can't build a country based on the rule of law. Let me ask you this, uh, Helen, as well, just uh, of the reported letter uh, from yourself. This is from uh, the conversation we're having at the moment as mm -hmm. well, uh, talking about uh, this, uh, this letter from you accusing him of publicly and unreasonably disparaging the party. You seem to have addressed that. It goes further, though, where he says that uh, the constitutional imperative of freedom of speech is always necessary, but in this case, it appeared only to be reserved for Helen Zilla. What's your <laughs> response to that? You know, it's bizarre. I mean, he's playing in Herman's playbook. You know, Herman's playbook is that he uh, says to a leader, well, you know, I'll give you a position or whatever he does, and resign and then say you're going to think about it and then start accusing the DA of arrogance. That came, comes straight out of the playbook of um, various people who are trying to break up these coalitions. So I could see the pattern developing. He never meant to go in good faith. He meant to go out and disparage us, but he first wanted to remain a member. Now. If there's one thing that I am, it's a free speech fundamentalist. Everybody knows that. I believe that you should be able to say anything within the law that stops at hate speech. And hate speech is very, very narrowly defined. It's not anything that anybody finds offensive. That's not hate speech. I'm pretty much a free speech fundamentalist. But when you voluntarily decide to join an organization, they have rules, mm. and you choose to join it. No one forces you. And our rules are in our constitution. That is the contract between a member of the DA and the DA. And Zwakele Mwango knows that. Zwakele Mwango was a member of the federal executive. He was at Congresses where we drew up and amended that constitution for years. And he had never had any problem with it. He never raised a problem with, oh, no, this is going to infringe on our freedom of speech. Or the, one of the rules says you cannot unreasonably disparage the party publicly 
without raising issues in the right forums inside. That's one of the rules. And it, as part of our disciplinary process, which is also embedded in the Constitution, it says that once you do start disparaging the party unreasonably, externally and continually, you get a letter from my office to say, cease and desist. It's called a cease and desist letter. So Kelly Mwango knows that. Many people have received cease and desist letters. So of course I believe in freedom of speech, but if you voluntarily join the DA and you sign up to its rules, then you mustn't cry when the rules are applied to you. Mm. So Akele Mwango never cried when the rules were applied to scores of people when he was sitting on the federal executive. But now suddenly, where he knows that he's not going to get much further than he has got in politics and probably has greater ambitions, now he's got to find another principled reason, this time freedom of speech. Everybody in the DA knows, everybody in the DA knows, that you can say anything to any leader on any issue if you disagree with them. You can't say, you know, a rude word and tell them to, to get lost in that way. I won't say that on a family show. You can't do that. But if you say, I fundamentally disagree with you, you're going in the wrong direction. This is going to undermine the party. I do not vote for this. Of course you're allowed to do that. People do that all the time. Mm. And if anybody, anybody who sits on any forum that I chair, if you ask anybody who's honest, they will tell you that I listen to alternative arguments, that I incorporate it, and I hold my views strongly, but always provisionally until a better argument comes along. That is what free speech adherents do. And unlike any other party, you're not earmarked because you disagreed with John Steenhuisen or Helen Ziller. Never. You're allowed to have your free speech, but you're not allowed to go out there in terms of our rules and keep disparaging the party unreasonably and expect that you're not going to get a letter from me. So can they also say there was a, a, a fear within the party that many people who aren't in the leadership structures, that there's uh, a concept of fear uh, mm -hmm. and bullying within the Democratic Alliance. People are scared to voice their opinions. And you, and you uh, alluded to that now. Mm -hmm. Is it maybe being seen as because the, uh, the DA wants to stick to the rules so closely that even they'll get letters cease and desist from your office, that it's coming across as bullying and they're too scared to speak up? It Is there fear in the DA? It can't possibly. Well, you know, I can't speak for every individual in the DA. But all I know is that we're a party of the rule of law. We have strong internal institutions. Anybody can speak their mind anywhere. We just had a meeting with the Johannesburg caucus a couple of days ago. Some people strongly criticized or differed, and we welcomed it and we listened and we adjusted our views on the basis of it. That is what you do. If you're a liberal, you're always wanting to listen to another person's argument. And we come together because we share certain values, but we have to have rules, that's our constitution. If you go to other parties, you probably won't even see their constitution. I don't know if Gayton McKenzie has a constitution. I think he's the constitution. I don't think there are any rules for anybody. It's only what he says. And I think, sadly, the same is true for many other parties. But the DA has a constitution that we've worked on very hard. We have congresses at which we amend the constitution. Everybody knows what it says, and everybody plays within those rules. That's why we can build strong institutions. The DA is the only party in South Africa that has strong institutions. And you know what? So Akel is very interesting as an example. He wants to disparage us and he wants to disparage me in particular, maybe John too. But we found out a number of things about Zwakele that he should have disclosed in his application to be a public representative because we have an application process, we have a vetting process. And this was discovered later on. And we fudged it. We fudged it because... What are those things? Well, I don't want to... I'll destroy his life if I go out on public television and say it. I could do it, but I'm not a vindictive person. So should he not be in public service anyway? He should never have been a public representative on that basis in the DA. Other parties might not mind. Other parties might not mind. But we accommodated it because we're a party who believes give a guy a chance and perhaps because we knew that he was going to make all these allegations if we did anything about it because some people aren't as honorable as other people some people can't self-reflect some people can't say have i in any way contributed to this so you know it is extraordinary 
When I was a journalist, Tomelo, and I was for many years, I had excellent training, and the training was never repeat a lie unless you've established it to the truth. And tragically in South Africa, journalism just parrots the easy lie. The DA is arrogant, for example, is the latest one, rather than getting to the truth. The easy label that people only use when they have run out of rational arguments, it's trotted out as if it's a fact on television all the time. Mm. This notion that all these black leaders are leaving the DA, well, in one week, a few, a month and a half ago, during one week, Action SA lost more black leaders, six, than we had lost in three years. But do you think anybody knows that? No, because a black leader leaving a party, and it's not even a leader. I mean, people aren't in leadership positions. This is the joke. They're ordinary members. They're not in leadership positions. But suddenly, if they're leaving the DA, they become elevated to the most amazing leaders. And the only time a politician leaving a party becomes a news story is if they leave the DA and if they're black. But are you concerned about this perception publicly? Well, I'm, I'm concerned that people parrot it without actually getting to the truth. I mean, take a look at the ANC. They once were a non-racial party. Today, the DA is the only truly non-racial party in South Africa. We're the only party with a properly diverse leadership and a support base that is one-third black, one-third brown, and one-third white. We're the only party that has that support base. Every other party is almost overwhelmingly one race. We have a diverse leadership. We have diverse people in key leadership positions doing excellently. And people need to portray the DA in this way because they've got nothing left. We're the party of good government. We're the only party that governs well in South Africa. Surely that should be the debate. Surely that should be the debate. Who governs better? And we're going to talk about that because, of course, we have ANC elective conference in uh, December as well. But we'd like to talk as well about mm -hmm. 2024 as well. But before we get to 2024, uh, you mentioned a moment ago, Helen, that uh, you were a journalist back in the day mm -hmm. and you were heavily involved in uh, media freedoms and media independence, of course. I would like to get your thoughts quickly off the court case we've all been following, Karen Morn and Billy Downer. More on the Karen Morn being taken to court by the former president, Jacob Zuma. Is, does this seem unprecedented to you? If you had to give me just a, a moment of your time on that, what do you make of seeing a journalist privately prosecuted by a politician? Well, you know, people have rights. And anybody has the right to sue anybody else. You know, we, we live in a free country. Why are journalists somehow um, protected from the challenges that other people have to face? I mean, she could defend it easily, and I'm sure that she's going to win. It's, it's not helpful to media freedom, but on the other hand, just look at it from our perspective. You see the lies spewed out. I mean, I'm talking from my, from my own perspective. I'm not talking to, to about Jacob Zuma now, not at all. Jacob Zuma is on a mission to delay his day in court and going to jail. We know that, we know that. I don't know the intricacies of his case against Karen Moore, and I don't comment on things that I haven't read myself and don't know myself. But I read things in, the, especially the English media. The Afrikaans media takes some trouble still. But the English media are largely, I don't want to even generalize about that, but largely a lost cause in South Africa. And I read the quality and I read the complete mm -hmm. misrepresentation, the complete decontextualization. I mean, even the pictures they choose to, to run of people are just so distorted and so designed to create a, an, an image. And people feel that the media only has rights and that no one else has rights. And even the in, in IOL has opted out of the ombudsman system, so there's nothing you can do. I took them to the ombudsman about five, six times, one every case, and then they opted out of the entire system. So what do you do? Just sit at the end of their battering ram all the time? Um, and, you know, the, the media have also adopted this notion that offence is hate speech, which, of course, it isn't, you know. So they should actually defend some free speech now and again and, f and defend some other people's uh, freedoms. They're quite happy to completely decontextualise people's remarks, mm -hmm. to manufacture outrage and to join that machine. So while I 
have a very low regard of the English-speaking newspapers, particularly in South Africa, a profoundly low regard of them, and that that spills over into what I hear, you know, you saying while I was waiting here to Melo, and even mm. you saying, Gareth, I think, oh, there they go, parroting this nonsense again. But I just take it. Let me say the only conclusion I have is this. The advantages of a free media, even if it is totally incompetent, outweighs the disadvantages. The out advantages outweigh the disadvantages. But believe me, I can personally say, and our party can say, that the disadvantages are massive when the misrepresentation and distortion happens day after day after day. Yeah, that, that, that's more traditional media. And, and, and just in the same breath, uh, if we may, Helen, talk about social media on the other hand. I mean, you are quite the controversial figure on social media. A lot of times what you tweet goes viral or it causes quite a stir. It's retweeted, you're challenged on it, you're accused of this mm -hmm. and that. Mm -hmm. You know, you're told to retract. Uh, mm -hmm. You are then, there are calls to boycott you all the time. And it reminds <laughs> me of a recent tweet, rather a retweet of a post uh, which, which you retweeted from Pumlani and Majosi. This also got some, you know, people commenting about um, and I'm quoting here, Pumlani Majuzi, which you retweeted, breeding children out of wedlock and then sending them to be raised by Gogos is disgraceful. Mm -hmm. This is one of, I'm sure, many that in your experience mm -hmm. you know have gone viral. Mm -hmm. What's your relationship with social media and your interaction outside of traditional media in terms of how you are perceived, how you're engaged on, how you're vilified, how you are told to backtrack, how you're called a racist numerous times based on what you share and express on social media? Well, there's nothing racist about saying that <clears throat> having a baby at 12 and 13 and 14 and sending it back to Gogo to be raised is something that we should not accept as normal in a society. And it's become totally normal. When I was the Premier in the Western Cape, we had girls as young as 10 and the youngest was 9 getting pregnant. This idea that multiple intergenerational sexual partners is absolutely fine is not fine in our society. Because what it does is, it locks people into poverty. I'm not speaking from some kind of high moral standpoint, but I can tell you that if you are 14 or 15, let alone 12 or 13, and have a child out of wedlock that the father will never bother about and never support, and you are unlikely to finish your education, and you will be locked into poverty for the rest of your life with a child that you can't support, and you'll probably have seven, several more children and be dependent your whole life long. That's the disgrace. I am going to war against older men who make young girls pregnant. That is statutory rape, and far more should be charged with statutory rape. Our problem is to beat poverty in South Africa. And one of the great drivers of poverty is teenage pregnancies. And one of the great drivers of dysfunctionality is children growing up in homes where there are no ro role models or very few, where a granny is raising a whole lot of children way past her energy levels for doing so, where fathers are itinerant if they rock up at best. Now, obviously, you can't say that that is in the whole of society. There are some brilliant fathers. But to have as a general rule the family unit being a single parent with a father absent is a terrible pattern to build a society on and one that entrenches poverty permanently. Uh, maybe this is the issue, isn't it, Helen? That you, you've explained it quite well now on this particular platform, but by resharing that. I mean, this retweeting of social media, it's always, it's messy, isn't it? Subtweeting and retweeting. It's, you can talk to the social media gurus and they always have an opinion about this. Instead of explaining it like that, what it came across was is that you're, in, you're endorsing the word breeding simply by retweeting oh, it. Oh, for goodness sake, I didn't even use that word. But you reshared it. Pumlani Majorzi used that word. So now this is what I'm saying. Mm. You've got a lot of people who are professional, what can I call them? outrage archaeologists. Mm. That's a term I've heard used. They go digging around in social media until they find something that they can be outraged about, which may be a black man using the word breeding 
And I look at the full meaning. I don't look at pulling it out of context and getting hysterical and trying to manufacture outrage. I look at the full meaning of what he's trying to say. I don't decontextualize it. There's no outrage against him, but the outrage is on me for retweeting it. What mm. kind of lunacy is that? Now, that is racism. Because when a black man says something, it's fine. When a white woman retweets it, ah, oh, that's a moment where the outrage archaeologists can dig in and say, OK, now we've got something to be outraged about. Now we have something so that we can feel victimized and oppressed by. That Zilla is, that has retweeted a full contextual version of what Pumlani Majorzi said. This is the madness. And that is why I will not buckle to it. Twitter is supposed to be the town square. Everybody is allowed to have their opinion on it. And I certainly believe in expressing mine. The bottom line is that it has been taken over by people who subscribe to critical race theory and who don't believe they're anybody unless they're victims. And then search all day for reasons why they are victims and then present themselves as oppressed victims. What's victimizing young women is having babies at 12, 13, 14. Let's look at the real source of victimization. It's not somebody pointing that out. Mm. And, and what about, I suppose, not only the tweets uh, that you have personally um, authored that have been seen as controversial, but the back and forth with some of the DA members um, publicly. I mean, we have seen you uh, tweet and retweet, or maybe some subtweeting you and you sending a tweet. As the DA, what's that relationship like on social media, even with party members? Give me examples. When it comes to Mbaluntuli, when Mbaluntuli was uh, leaving, uh, there was a back and forth, even from her side. Pumzile, uh, no, 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 Van Dam was, as well. I'll tell you where there was a back and forth. Mm. I was on, um, I think, the Clement Magnatella show. That's what it was, the Clement Magnatella show. And I had said that according to our minutes and our attendance registers, Mbali and Tuli had hardly attended any federal councils at all. And I put the attendance registers there because she was being painted as, as this incredible leader who played such a major role in the DA and done what. And I was being, you know, battered and given, being blamed for all of this. And one of the points I made was, you know, she hardly attended any of the meetings she was supposed to attend. And then she got very upset and started fighting with me on social media, at which point I desisted, but someone in my office said, we've got all the records to show. So, you know, when people f fight with me, I think, is this worth it? 90% of the time it isn't. I don't like being misrepresented. But if she uh, is going to start saying that I'm a liar, when I've got all the records to show it, then I won't keep quiet. We have a, a couple of minutes left. Uh, we're going to move away. We could talk about Twitter all day. I mean, I'm sure <laughs> yeah. we could spend all morning talking about it. But I do want to get back to, uh, in the last few minutes, terms of if it's OK, mm, to mm. just look ahead to 2024. We're going to tie this in again to where we basically started, Helen, the, mm. the coalitions. Uh, you may have heard, I think you were here when I mentioned earlier, there's a concern around coalition governments currently. We've spoken about that. 2024 national elections. What if this turns into a national coalition government? What is that going to look like, considering how messy it is now? Well, I've written about this before, Gareth. You know, everyone thinks, ah, oh, independent candidates are going to be our salvation. They are suddenly going to be this ethical, wonderful people who don't have any self-interest in self-enrichment or anything like that and will be accountable to the people. Mm. Nonsense. There's nothing to suggest that there'll be anything different from the normal South African politician that we've seen driving after their own interests, looking for jobs for pals, seeking to get their hand in the till of tenders and other things. And the big thing we have to prevent is this fragmentation. We can only have a stable coalition if there are two or three parties or four maybe maximum. But if you get in there with scores of independents who get a fraction of a percent of a vote and tiny parties who have one public representative each in the National Assembly and you're trying to put coalitions together of 10 parties, well then the complete instability that we're finding at local level will 
go to national level. That's an absolute nightmare scenario. Is there just too many parties? Is this the problem? Well, that's why I spoke about the threshold. We need a threshold, number one. And secondly, we need a legal environment in which a coalition agreement is seen as a binding contract for a full term. All these random, mo you've got to be able to pass a motion of no confidence with a reason in a president or whatever it is. You must be able to do that. But the coalition agreement itself needs to be binding for a full term so people can't shop around for a better deal. You've signed on the bottom line here, you've got two positions. The ANC comes and says, listen, we'll give you this tender, mm. we'll give you four mm. positions in our offices, we'll just load up the, the staff complement and you can have three of those people and we will give you another maker position, rather come to us. That politics by extortion and bribery has to stop. We don't have coalition politics, we have extortion politics in South Africa. Yeah. My, my concern is that, um, as I'm hearing about the deals that happen behind closed doors politically... We don't do those deals. The DA doesn't do those deals. You don't do those deals, it's no. just the ANC and other Let parties. Let me explain to you mm -hmm. how we negotiate coalitions. We have a pro forma that we, that we moderate and that we customize for every single place that we do a, a coalition agreement. So, our coalition agreements start with discussing values and principles values and principles and we go through them all now amazingly enough you know things like integrity and all of that transparency all of that stuff that is the easiest part of the coalition agreement tick 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 everybody agrees motherhood and apple pie except they don't most of them don't know what it means to apply those in practice haven't got a clue mm. so the easiest part of the coalition agreement to discuss is the values because everyone says of course we agree with integrity of course we agree with their transparency but come the day when that value is put to the test, it's gone like the morning mist. Mm. People don't even make the connection. Right. Then there we, we look at joint programs of government, the priorities of government going forward. Then we look at what happens when there's a disagreement. Deadlock breaking mechanisms, structures and systems. We've got a coalition oversight group, which is all the leaders of the parties who come together. Let me tell you, most leaders of parties have never once come to a coalition oversight group. Herman mm. Schaub has come to one, as I recall, to help resolve problems. But be that as it may, implementing these agreements is the difficult and thing. And that's, I was coming to that, Helen, to say, and then the where last are thing. the people, if I may finish my point, where, where are the residents, where are the people, where are the South Africans in these agreements with the negotiations, with the chopping, with the motions? Because I, I see the political, you know, uh, deals you're making behind, uh, yeah. that are happening behind the deals, the point you're making there, yeah. and that's sabotaging the coalition. But where are the South Africans? Because Mpopaleta, for example, will start a project, but obviously, who is going to inherit any of her initiatives should she fail and the ANC comes? Because it seems everything will be collapsed okay. that she started. Tumelo, where are the South Africans? The South Africans are the voters who should be looking at the manifestos of different parties, mm -hmm. should be looking at their record in government, should be looking at the levels of integrity they bring to government, should be doing all of those things before they vote. That's where the South Africans come into politics. And then the next time they come in is they call their government to account. They ask questions, the opposition asks tough questions in government. All the systems and structures are there for accountability. And where they come in in the coalition agreement is that we all come with our manifestos and we do a joint program of government. These are the priorities of government. And they are spelt out and the priorities of government are there to serve the people, to reflect the manifestos of the parties on which they got elected. And there they are to serve the people and to do the very best that you can for the people. That's what we discuss right up front in the mm. coalition agreement. At the very end, we come to positions in government. Now, that's the issue that everybody's interested in. And that is the make or break issue for many parties. Mm. And they get as much as they can get from the DA. But the ANC looks at what they've got, looks at what they can offer doesn't worry about the principles and values, doesn't worry about the joint programs in government, doesn't worry about the deadlock breaking mechanisms, just about the positions. And that is why we have the politics of extortion in South Africa. Talk to me about 2024, uh, Helen, just mm -hmm. before we say goodbye to you. We will leave this as our last question. Uh, 2024A, how do you imagine the DA is going to navigate everything you just explained? Because it almost seems impossible for anyone to get it right. And then two, 
Uh, it seems that some political parties and coalitions will now work with all political parties. Will the DA work with the ANC, for example, 2024? What we will do going into 2024 is that we will put our manifesto out there as we always do. We will say to people, read what our commitments are when we get into government. The first will have to be to fix 30 years of destruction by the ANC because there is nothing the ANC touches that it doesn't destroy, nothing. There's not a single government department, not a single state-owned enterprise, not a single thing the ANC has governed that it hasn't destroyed. So when, if we ever come to government nationally, well, when we come to government nationally, the first five years are spent fixing things. I even found that in, in Cape Town when I became the mayor and in the Western Cape when I became the premier, even though the ANC hadn't been in government nearly as long to break nearly as much as they have done nationally or in the other provinces. So we were lucky in Cape Town, the Western Cape, we took the ANC out of power earlier on, much earlier on. So the first five years are spent fixing the complete destruction. I mean, what are you going to do about water in Johannesburg when people don't even have those basics? The potholes that we saw on the road in that insert, mm. these are basic things that government has to do. And if anybody comes to the Western Cape, you will see that we do that. So we will say to people, judge on governance record. Judge on which party is the most diverse and inclusive. I mean, the ANC's only got one white left, and that's Carl Niehaus, I think, and they're still trying to get rid of him too. So, you know, judge on diversity, judge on inclusion, judge on capacity, and make one strong party the anchor tenant of a coalition. If you have scores and scores of these tiny parties, you can be sure before you begin that the government will fail. You can be sure before you begin that the government will fail. The DA is not perfect. No living human being is. But we are streets and streets and streets better than any other alternative in South Africa. All right, we'll leave it there. I appreciate you coming on. Helen Ziller, thank you so much for joining us right here on the South African Morning. Yeah, I really appreciate the time. A Democratic yeah. Federal Council Chairperson mm -hmm. answering a lot. And I'm sure there's a lot yeah. of questions that many people have tweeted us. I couldn't get to some of them. Must be honest, I was so, so busy focusing on the conversation. I didn't get to all of them. But uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of reaction to what Helen Ziller had to say mm -hmm. uh, here on the SA Morning. If we didn't see your tweets, apologies. We will try and gather some of those later. Well, and come uh, again. of course, lots that we <laughs> will pick up oh, she's on. Oh, to come again. I, I, Helen Ziller said she'll come back. Yeah. You, can you didn't ask me tweets. about Hilbert. I wanted to tell you what oh, it was very like quickly, then Hillbrow. Well, Hillbrow was fantastic. Uh, do you remember Fontana? You know, you're much too young to remember Fontana. <laughs> Fontana opened as the first 24-hour shop. And we used to go there at night, Fontana, after a date or whatever, you'd go to Fontana, you'd walk the streets, it was oh. really nice and safe. Yeah, I, I lived in the border, border of Berea and Yeovil, there for many years, fantastic. Yeovil became completely non-racial, as did Berea, wonderful. I lived in a little flat of, of uh, Louis Boutot Avenue in Orange Grove. I, I, it was wonderful times. Now when I drive through those areas, my heart breaks. My heart breaks. Forget about going to the middle of Hillbrow in the middle of the night and walking the streets there and going for coffee or whatever it is at Fontana and getting a nice sandwich at Fontana. I wouldn't even get out the car in Hillbrow mm. today mm. in the middle of the night. Well, that was one of the tweets from one of our viewers mm -hmm. asking about uh, Hilbra, mm -hmm. uh, what Helen had to think about Hilbra when we started the show. Yeah. Helen Zilla with us. Appreciate it. Uh, plenty more reaction, I'm sure, to what Helen Zilla had to say yeah. here on ENC.